They said that we were trash. Well, the name is Crash, not Clash. They can stuff their punk credentials. It's them that take the cash. They won't charge enough for their festival talk. Oh, they are badges in their protest wall. Found a right men standing in a park. Objected to ice them to care in the dark. Black man's got his problems, he's right to deal with it. Tonight, so pull yourself real with your white liberal shit. If you get them, take a close look at the way things really stand. You'll see the long just figures to the rulers of this land. A typical crash gig would be a, a big hall uh, with banners everywhere. Uh, very dark, a uh, lot of people milling around, uh, drunk punks collapsed at the back, uh, a few skinheads trying to cause trouble, a real air of uh, atmosphere of tension, always on, on the lookout for trouble starting, probably a rumour going around that there were 500 um, National Front skinheads coming to beat the shit out of us, so just waiting for the doors to burst open and then getting on stage and being spat on and f sometimes things thrown at you, but just like real sort of tension. I think what Crass was trying to do, but it had to do it in an orderly way, was to say that it is possible. You know, it's possible to exist outside of the framework. G and myself have really fought hard to sort of understand what it means, rather than just sort of falling into sort of conventional uh, ways of dealing with it. We've, we, we've maintained the open door policy, we've maintained you know, trying to expand and extend that and incorporate anyone in the same way as Crass incorporated anyone. Um, against a, a society which actually has been increasingly closing its doors. Um, you know, I think that, you know, from the 70s, which was really our sort of era in a way, you know, the sort of liberationist era, you know, the, the fight's got harder and harder and harder. Do you want me to do it? Or no, I'm happy to do it. Alright, yeah. you're up for it. What was he playing in then? We're going in. That's <laughs> one. It might be an idea to see... Oh, no, are we, are we going to have the big fire tonight? I think it's weather permitting. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's to start. It's not big enough for it, kind of draws it. So did anyone come up with any sort of interesting, or does anyone want to ask anything about the house, or how it's run, or what you've seen or not seen, or anything? Or? I'm quite interested in the crass agenda, and how that's evolved. I was speaking to Ron earlier about it. <laughs> <laughs> and wanting to find out about it. When I opened the doors up here, which was 40 years ago, whatever it was, it was very much with the idea of being creative um, centre. I mean, we were always organic because it's more sensible and it's cheaper, but always the prime reason for us being here, and, and most of the people who've remained as residents here have been creating you know, artists or writers or filmmakers or musicians. Um, and then in our spare time, effectively, we tend the garden and do all that stuff. Um, and we've done masses of projects, you know, and Crass was the only project that ever became sort of renowned. It was a punk band, very, very political, very much... Prim I mean, our major um, statement was there is no authority but yourself, 
you know, in other words, life's your responsibility. On the one hand, we're sort of viciously opposed to uh, what then wasn't known as globalization, but we, we defined as just being um, rampant capitalism. Um, so on the one hand, we had a very political agenda, but on the other hand, we had a very DIY agenda of basically, well, get a life, sort yourself out, you know. On the one hand, to oppose the material world on every front, and at the same time, you know, offer practical ways of doing it. So on the one hand, we'd be sort of, you know, hand giving out handouts on how to make petrol bombs or something like other, you know, and, and at the same time, how to make your own bread. Experience. I hadn't seen it or anything. And then I came out of work one day and I noticed a, a, a poster for a band called The Clash that were playing at the Colston Hall. So I just went along to see what, was, what it was about and I was just knocked out by it that for the first time in my life there were a bunch of working class uh, blokes, um, young men, looking absolutely really frightening, saying the sort of things that I'd always wanted to say. Um, that previously I'd, <clears throat> I'd sort of got into David Bowie and things like this and sort of liked it, but it was never that, it was always that superstar thing. And, and now on the stage were these working class guys coming from the same background I had, saying exactly the things I wanted to say. And, and I was like, and then when Joe Strummer at the end of it said, if you think you can do better, start your own fucking band. And I was like, that's what I, yeah, I want to do that. So I went to visit uh, Penny Rambo at Dahl House. He was living there on his own at the time. And he said, what are you, what are you doing? And I said, I'm going to start a band. And he said, I'll play drums for you if you like. So then I said, well, what about other members? And he said, no, let's just have drums and vocals. And that's how it started. I was writing a lot. And then one day Steve turned up. I'd been listening to Patti Smith and some of that sort of stuff. I'd got an old drum kit, and we just started mucking about. As we went on mucking about, other people would turn up, and they wanted to muck about as well. And really, that's how it was. I mean, we certainly didn't take ourselves seriously, and we certainly didn't expect anyone else to take us seriously. We had no ambition to... Well, I had no ambition, Steve might have done, but I certainly had no ambition to do anything you know, within a sort of consensual, within the construct. What exactly did you want to say? Uh, fuck off, you bastards, uh, I hate you, uh, I want more money, why do I have to work, stop telling me what to do, uh, all coppers are bastards, you know, what does a young man want to say when he's angry and it's, um, but then, um, speaking with Penny Rambo, it was a bit more, well, perhaps have a, you know, just really think about what you want or what you don't like and then 
be a bit more political about it, or you know, personal political, so and a bit more poetic, and yeah. And then I was a living, of course they fucking do. So, yeah. <laughs> and I still want to say those things anyway. So, oh, so you didn't change really? <laughs> no, I, but the trouble is now I don't know how to say it. You know, I, and I, there's me at 48 years old, still going, fuck off, I hate you. <laughs> but it's not quite the same when you've got a ball. <laughs> There was a David Bowie song called um, Ziggy Stardust, and there's a line in it where he says, uh, Ziggy played guitar, driving us to, uh, he was voodoo, the kids was just crass. And crass means grossly stupid and, you know, pathetic, so yeah, it's a good name. At that time, it was fun to be ignorant and stupid. Oh, that's why I chose the name Ignorant for myself, because at that time I was really ignorant about politics. I didn't know what I wanted or what I wanted to do. And people had said to me before, you're an ignorant bastard, Steve Ignorant. Simple as that. Well, Steve was from, you know, basically quite a poor working class background, and I was from, you know, quite a wealthy upper class, or upper middle class background. Um... And generally speaking, I think it is true to say that most bands are made up of, you know, people from the same background. Uh, because generally speaking, younger people tend to hang around with people from their own background because it's more comfortable for them. Um, and that did make us different. Well, my sort of uh, middle class, sort of off the street experience and Steve's working class on the street experience made a very, very interesting combination, I think. Yeah, it's not that I'm right wing or nothing, but you know, England is the best country in the world. No. I've never seen any difference between sort of bohemian, beatnik, hippie, um, punk. I mean, they're all one of the same to me. So, I, I mean, I, I regard that just as a sort of authenticity, and you know, or an, an attempt to achieve some sort of authentic lifestyle. <laughs> Just one. Spickle, no good lessons. Go over nuts. Thank you. <laughs> Come on, earn your money. Oh, oh, fucking saucer. What a wanger. <laughs> fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my brother took me to visit um, Dahl House. And uh, at that time, I was uh, not a skinhead, but it was, the th it was the fashion afterwards in England called suede heads. Um, and I, I went there, and I couldn't understand what the hell was going on. Uh, the, uh, these people had stones in their living room as ornaments, fucking stones in your house. They should be in the garden, using words that I'd never heard of before. But what I really liked about Penny Rambo and, and uh, uh, G was that for the first time in my life, they, if they asked me a question, or if I had said something, they'd respect, they'd answer me and treat me as an equal. And it's the first time I'd ever had that, so I kept going back to visit. Uh, so when me and Penn were starting Christ, um, 
we could just talk. It, it, it didn't matter. It really didn't matter. Because I just used to live with my parents in Dagenham and, and whatever I said, because I was into poetry and, and all this sort of stuff. And I, I discovered a bloke called, um, um, I'd read a book by a guy called Oscar Wilde. Uh, called uh, um, uh, The Picture of Dorian Gray. I really got into poetry and started writing my own poetry and, yeah, sort of writing songs because I wanted to be David Bowie. But my mum and dad always sort of said, oh, you know, you'll never do it in, you know, the usual work and I was thinking you would end up in factory. But for, for the first time, when I first met Penny Rambo and, and, and G, I was, for the first time, uh, listened to as a human being or as an adult, even though I was only 13 years old and tried to talk out of my little arsehole about Walt Whitman or something, having a conversation with a bloke who was older than me, who'd, who'd been to college and sort of done things. I just thought that was fantastic. And for the first time, someone was actually interested in my opinion, and I'd never read that before, and that's a pretty, you know, that's a pretty big thing. Um, and so when, when it was crass, it was the same thing. There wasn't. We were just friends, you know. And I, I'd always respect him for that. He's always respected that for me, you know. And we really did blow away that, that upper class, working class divide. And we were just two guys doing it. We all lived in the same house. Um, you couldn't have um, you couldn't have crass without what was happening in our personal lives. It was all so interwoven. You can't separate them. So it never stopped. Um, it wasn't like we went to the rehearsal studio and then played crass. The rehearsal room was in our house, so it was like, right, okay, then what are we doing tomorrow? Rehearsing. It never stopped. The phone was ringing. People were coming to visit all the time, um, you know, punks coming to camp in the garden and all this kind of stuff. So you never got away from it. And the experience for me was just it never stopped. And it was a lifestyle. A good one. I wouldn't change, you know, I wouldn't change it. We never had rules. Um, for example, if uh, uh, we're 15 people living in the same place, uh, if there was washing up to be done, it, it wasn't, you know, there wasn't a rotor and on Wednesday Steve does the washing up, you just did it. Uh, and the whole uh, way of living like that was, well, consideration for other people first. Is it running truly stuck? Is it running Has it gone? Stuck? No, it's still up there. Nick's taking some film. Oh, yeah. Quick, get in it. Quick. No, oh, don't pretend. <laughs> <laughs> Just ask him, like, it's so fucking swamped with those flyers, isn't it? Yeah. Do you want some help with them? Aye. Do you want some help? No, it's nothing to do with How high is it? Um, right at the top, but I think it's only held by about two branches, mm. as usual. <laughs> what? You just had to look cool. Not at all, just you. <laughs> you were. Yeah, you were. <laughs> In 1967, I found the place where I'd spent about a year driving round the uh, southeast of England, sort of looking for somewhere. Uh, in those days, people, you know, wouldn't have dreamt of moving into somewhere like this. Nowadays, they're very fashionable, very, very valuable. Tea time. <laughs> I saw a film. Where it's the end of the Sixth Happiness. There's a movie about. Chinese inns and they had this tradition of people turn you know like walking to the inn and then they would tell their story then the next day they'd move on and go somewhere else and I was rather inspired at the idea of sort of opening up somewhere where people could come and they'd sort of pay for their supper and a bed by telling a story that was my romantic idea
And my romantic idea was that if people liked it, they'd do something similar. So by now, 40 years later, or 38 years later, the, I thought there'd be hundreds of places like this right across Britain. But uh, in fact, no one, as far as I know, has ever attempted to recreate the, the system that this place works on, because, as you know, it's not a commune, it's an open door. Most communes manage to survive based around some sort of ideology or religion or whatever. And I'm not interested in, you know, sort of shared ideologies or religions. Um, and the open door policy, which is the one we have operated on since then, um, allows people to come and it allows people to go and it allows conflicts to develop and allows loves to develop, all sorts of things, without any condition. It's a very unconditional um, state of affairs. And creatively, I suppose, that was reflected in the sense that, you know, if someone said, oh, can I join the band, and there wasn't any question as to yes or no. I mean, it was an automatic, of course you can, what can you do? And it didn't matter if they couldn't do anything at all, like Andy. I mean, he hadn't got a clue what to do with the guitar, but, you know, he got one and um, made a noise on it, so that's good enough. <laughs> We kind of got very excited about, you know, uh, the punk scene when the first wave of it, it seemed really exciting. At last, you know, there was a youth culture growing that was saying, well, just fuck off, you know, and all the rest of it. Well, we, we felt it was, but then it started to sort of sour for us because uh, I suppose the idea of no future was sort of not, really not in our realm. I suppose, you know, we were... Accused of being old hippies, well, fine, you know, the old hippies had a dream and we still dream it, you know, and still aim for that, you know, and uh, which is about coming together. And, that, you know, that's difficult in itself. Um, so I suppose we, we took up that area of music and expression because none of us were musicians particularly, <laughs> and the whole ethos was just get up and do it, just express it. I'm not a great stage person, so <laughs> it suited me with Chris to, uh, you know, do the artwork and film work and anything else I could, you know, write songs and... And the artwork was really the covers. Yeah, I mean, it was really the involvement with the whole aesthetic of uh, presentation, really, um, because I... I think it's really, really important. It's another language. I mean, and we were all very interested in not only the words, not only the sound, but the presentation and how we could try something very new and try to cut through and find a new language, really. It seems to have been very positive for a lot of people on different levels. I mean, hopefully it didn't... Well, I know it didn't come over as... Uh, dictatorial at all in what we're trying to say, I think obviously came over very angry. <laughs> There's some in that one. Can you turn the other one off for us? Yeah.
Mathieu. Hey! <laughs> it's Ron! the needs uh, we feel for a standard family that would live there it won't do everything okay but as a start as a way of reducing the impact on needing supermarkets we thought that was one way we could start What we're doing this weekend, we're running a basic introduction to permaculture weekend. It's looking at just different ways, sustainable living really, it's looking at ways we can grow our food sustainably, uh, build sustainably, build sustainable housing, um, forestry management, water management, all kinds of aspects of human life really that we can actually do in more sustainable ways than we are currently in our culture at the moment. To absorb it and seal it. So you don't get smells, you know. Lifting the lid. <laughs> is, it, will it, is it supported by anything then? Will it, I mean, th that looks a, a bit precarious, like you could fall. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, you'll get used to it. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, gonna, it's all going to be boxed in. And there's there's going to be a structure. There'll be a surrounding structure. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was just, uh, that's just yeah. a demonstration, at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, you know what I thought? Up there, there's the... Uh, there's two desks which actually are still as desks. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, it, we could use one of them because they're double lidded. Look, and that fits. Yeah. As yeah. a sort of so to use the bog, you lift that up. Yeah, yeah, that would. And the other one enclosed. could could enclose the um, yeah, yeah. grass yeah. or whatever, yeah. and it would look neat. It would. It's ready made with hinges. We need. To, we need to. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. we've got to have that space, haven't we? Yeah. <laughs> Well, there was this idea of going to get another spike. Uh, mine, mine, mine! Spike. I thought I'd... Oh, a bit zapperish. Oh, 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 lovely yeah. lad. Yeah. 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 I think we should... You can actually see it go down. Shall I drop one? No! <laughs> The whole philosophy of the open house, uh, it was set up as a creative house, whatever that meant to people. So there's been films, books, music, everything written here or done, you know, painted here and or gardening. It didn't have to be the fine arts. It went into all sorts of things, you know. Uh, some people make a great art of making a fine cup of tea, which is fantastic, you know, making bread. You know, it has the extension, logical extension, is really um, doing something with a heart. So that whole ethos has never changed, really, and that's... Crass wasn't any different, you know, and all the things that happen have happened since is not any different. The spirit's the same. There's no more trials, um, No, um, is the swift answer to that. There were three, unless there are more 
Unless there were more down the bottom there. One of the greatest battles I've ever fought is just to remain in this place, you know, which is rightfully mine. Um, you know, because commodity culture wanted it, because it's worth a lot of money. Doesn't matter whether it's sort of, you know, the burial ground and the creation ground of soul, you know, they want, they want it. We effectively used an awful lot of the tactics and techniques that we'd developed with Crass on a much more sort of intimate level, you know, with the local village and the local townspeople, and we formed an action group, which was made up of people from the right, left, centre and everywhere else, um, who all wanted in some way or other, or for one reason or another, to try and preserve something of the sort of countryside that... Um, this whole area represents, and we're willing to sort of spend time to to do that. And we first of all beat off BT, who you know is a massive corporation, which was a huge success, and they wanted to turn this just into one huge sort of luxury housing estate for the wealthy, with the sort of big hotels and golf courses and shit knows what else. Uh, we did buy it uh, on borrowed money and um, from friends. And we still owe half of what we bought the house for, which was 160,000, which is very, very cheap, of course. But um, and it was very, very cheap because we were in it. I mean, it's not worth an awful lot of people, and people knew they couldn't get us out because we'd already won that case in the courts. I mean, what I want to do, uh, what I hope I'm able to do, is to finish paying off um, the house. Um, and then put it into trust, because that way, um, you know, maybe in 50 years, there'll still be people like us sitting around talking about nice things. Bye now, let's go. Bye now, say hello to put school to your life. To reach a traverse paradise and shape your dignity. A lovely colour consulting makes you watch your church and dice their fight. Give me a big the money can buy. Rush on shit, plastic crap. My life might be worth more than that. Black glass get out, chubby spray. I'm not a baker, but I'm safe. Lust on to our boots. Oh, happy days. The Shulagoli Store Show on the Shulagoli. Steve, did you hear that? David Beckham was wearing a Crass T-shirt. Yes, I did. Designed by Jean-Paul Gaultier. Now, that time I didn't really think anything. It was just like, well, that kind of stuff. People have been selling Crass merchandise for, like, years, and I've not bothered about it, so why should I bother about it now? You know, uh, and I didn't. But it's only recently that, uh, since I've had numerous people coming to me and saying uh, loads of Crass stuff has been sold on the Internet, uh, and there's a bloody clock. Uh, with a crash symbol on it, that you, you know, or um, Eve Libertine with the flag from the feet and 5,000 thing. Buy a clock, you can buy, uh, you know, obviously t shirts, uh, uh, little coasters, tea towels, and shit like this. And we and all of that money is going somewhere, and I don't know where the fucking hell it's going, so I just want to stop, try and stop that. It seemed very ironic that, you know, probably one of the wealthiest non-landed gentry, or well, certainly he must be one of the wealthiest people in this country, he was wearing a crass t-shirt. And then I just forgot about it. I mean, I did sort of think of following it up by maybe doing a t-shirt with him on it, wearing a crass t-shirt. I and mean, I just thought it'd be ironic to produce a t-shirt of him wearing a crass t-shirt with something like, you know, David supports crass. Um, and see, you know, how long it would be before they're lawyers tried it on with us. At the moment we're being ripped off um, and we're not getting paid for it. Well what we could do is still get ripped off but be paid for it. it you know this is the year 2006 now it's not 19 you know 1981 or whatever the world has changed and it's... And what's that, what do you mean by that? Uh, that it's not... In, in, in the late 70s and the early 80s it was possible to live on a dole and it was possible to not have a job or it, it, you could live without money now you can't it's really fucking difficult you've got to have money you've got to 
not you've got to have money. I sound like a fucking capitalist, you know, just not about money all the time. No, it, and it's not that. It's just the world is different now, and, and you have to move with it. And uh, and I I just am so frustrated with the with the thought that some fucking big company, um, you know, don't even know who Crass were, but it's the product sells well, so they're fucking selling it and getting the money for it, and we're not getting nothing. Fuck it. Bollocks, that's got to stop. That's, that's just crap. symbol on it. Only <laughs> bit remaining. It's been lots of things since then. It used to be completely lined with um, uh, carpet and then we had carpet and strips right across the ceiling so that it, um, you know, soundproofed it a bit. It was pretty bloody noisy in there as you can imagine with five of us playing. But, um, yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I told you we lost all the banners, didn't we? In, uh, in Amsterdam. But one remained, which is, has to be the right one really, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, there you go. I should be doing there is no force but yourself, all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. The one remainder. No, oh, Remo head. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> who invented the cross symbol? Really? There's a guy called Dave King who was uh, an art student, a uh, friend uh, who lived here. It was a frontispiece for the book I was writing because the book was about the state, the church and the family and I wanted something which, you know, was a sort of like a... the sort of fascism of... of of that control and that was the symbol which I think is a very brilliant piece of design. Serpent eating its own tail basically, destroying itself. How exactly was Kress uh, socially and politically active, how direct? Well, obviously, as a, um, an information service, we were very powerful. I mean, it was pre-internet, pre-computers, really. You know, so we didn't have that sort of outlet. But, I mean, the network we had was absolutely massive. Our own involvements were, well, varied from sort of sort of soft edge stuff like graffiti campaigns which were very very carefully done militaristically done graffitiing the central part of the underground network in London we'd start doing statements you know neatly we never sprayed on property we st spray sprayed on posters so say there was a war poster you know like a film poster for a war movie then we'd have uh, fight war, not wars on it, you know, very neatly. And we had this policy of being very neat so that 
it was sort of couldn't really be complained about as vandalism, not because I object to vandalism necessarily, but because it seemed a way in which we might be able to attract the interest of people who otherwise could dismiss it as vandalism. So it varied from that to sort of more, you know, direct actions of sort of super gluing or paint bombing, that sort of stuff. I mean, we never got into any sort of arson. Stop the City events of the early 80s, I suppose, were the uh, most extreme uh, manifestation of that in the sense that they were, they were sort of a mixture of part festival, part riot. Well, the idea was to close down the city, and I can't remember, there's two days in the year when, when certain figures are shifted in the city from one institution to another. It's when they you know, decide on the currency, all that sort of shit. Anyway, basically speaking, if you put the city out of operation on those days, then you know, you're really fucking up their entire modus operandi, like the banks and shipping agencies and that sort of stuff. Um, you know, from sort of smoke bombs in the underground, which completely stopped, has to stop the undergrounds, to, um, you know, banks were having their windows smashed in, streets were blocked, phones were blocked. I mean, the, the place became inoperable for a day. I believe, you know, that... that it, it set a pattern. I mean, certainly Reclaim the Streets came out of the Stop the City movement and, you know, inevitably, I think that... And the Stop the City thing actually did spread right across the globe. I mean, it started happening in Australia, America. I don't know whether it happened in Europe at all, but certainly modelled on the London ones. It, it was repeated in, I know, in Australia and America, you know, and I don't think that Seattle would have happened uh, in the same way. the record called um, How Does It Feel to Be the Mother of a Thousand Dead <coughs> and writing for one of the daily newspapers here uh, was a guy who did the music bit in it or the pop bit fucking prick and his brother uh, was a um, uh, conservative politician in Enfield so he says to his brother look what this band called Crass have done they've written about how does it feel to be the mother so the the politician gets, a, gets the arsehole, says how outrageous the record is and it's disgusting. Then we found, um, of course, then it, um, there was a circular, um, an, a memo passed around the House of Parliament in the Tory party saying on no account must any member of the Conservative Party have anything whatsoever to do with a band known by as the name of Crass. The opposition, Labour government, heard about it. We then... Uh, uh, started receiving letters of support from uh, the Labour uh, MPs and then a Labour MP actually mentioned it in the House of Commons that co Prime Minister's question is on it. Has the, has the Prime Minister listened to the latest record? How does it feel to be the mother of a thousand dead? Thatcher needed something to boost her public faith. She was failing miserably. Um, on her agenda, on her, you know, internal agenda, and needed something to boost her popularity. I mean, it was very jingoistic, and she did do. How the fucking hell did, you know, Bush manage to, you know, gain credibility through going into Iraq? Well, he has done, you know, despite the fact that it... I mean, and how, and how has Blair remained in power uh, after supporting... Uh, the invasion of Iraq. Um, but they do do, because people are essentially jingoistic. Look at a football match. 
You'll see one tonight and see how jingoistic. I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's guns or footballs, you know. When the men are out, they're out, aren't they? It's very difficult, you know, for a country in a state of war to actually dare to say, I object. You know, because, I mean, we were accused of being traitors, you know, both in the national media and by people down in pubs and that sort of shit. We put together a um, conversation between Thatcher and Reagan, which was edited out of actual speeches. And the basis of the conversation was basically Reagan questioning Thatcher about the, be the sinking of the Belgrano. We had had classified information from the Falklands. We knew a sailor who, who used to be a skinhead when he was heading out to the Falklands. And then um, he contacted us somehow or other and as he was returning and just spewed out all this information about the sinking of the Belgrana and the sinking of the Sheffield. The sinking of the Sheffield was something that still hasn't really come to light. I think it was four ships. It was one of the big flagships that actually Prince Andrew or Prince Edward, that one of the royal sons was on board. So obviously they had to ensure that that wasn't going to get whacked. The naval response was to order that three of the four ships should send up flak, you know, which is silver foil, which diverts missiles. Yeah. And the other one wasn't informed, the Sheffield. So it guaranteed that when the, when the missiles arrived, they would go for the one which wasn't protected by a foil shield, um, which it did, so the Sheffield was sunk. Um, and the men knew that. You know, and um, there was almost a mutiny, um, which is why the boats took so long coming back, because they had to sort that out. tapes out to um, mainland Europe, sent it to all the major newspapers in, in mainland Europe. And then that night we heard nothing. And then and the next thing we heard was um, a report um, in some American, I think it was a San Francisco uh, paper um, about KGB tapes, Pentagon exposing KGB tapes, and when we recognise them as being our tape. Um, you know, and then the, it, it became a really big story in the American press about, you know, um, KGB, the, these are the methods used, you know, to what will lead to the Third World War. And anyway, someone, this guy rang up, this reporter, and said, uh, do you know anything about these tapes? And I, you know, I, I picked up the phone and I said, no, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, well, I think you do, and I want to come out and talk to you about it. So I said, that, well, look, if, you were, if, if we were to admit it, would you be prepared to print all the information that's given on the tapes about the Sheffield and the Belgrano? And he said, yes, I could do that. And they did do it, you know, so we managed to get you know, this sort of really, you know, top secret classified information about the Belgrano and the Sheffield into the national, um, you know, sta the, the good quality press. Uh, it had no effect at all, so... <coughs> Except this sort of huge interest in us all of a sudden, and, you know, and at that point the KGB actually did get in touch with us. Um, under the guise of being a literary magazine and invited us up to their offices in um, West London, you know, which was obviously a complete sham. 
and it quite obviously was KGB, and basically they were seeing whether they, we were worth recruiting. Um, and at that, from that point on, it just became fucking stupid because it, we were no longer commentators and activists. You know, we'd become sort of sort of experts or something or other. Um, well, certainly, we became desirables to the secret services and that sort of rubbish. Um, and it started feeling really dangerous, to be honest. Passive lines, Why do you think Crash was uh, successful at the time? Because uh, we meant what we were saying, you know, we lived that truth. You know, we lived what we were talking about and, people, and it was self-evident that we did. You know, people could come here and they were welcome to come here as they always have been and they could see that we were living, you know, we, we didn't make anything. Well, I mean, we had lots of money at some, lots of at the time, but that all went into other projects. Yeah, that makes me laugh. <laughs> like, I've seen people do that. Like, yeah. Yeah, see, oh, well, the really fact that Crass earned money made no difference at all to this place. Um, we still had no money and we still have no money because any money we do have just goes straight into some sort of creative or social project. We financed an anarchist centre in London. That's the most obvious thing we did, but uh, and what, probably one of the most costly things we did. Um, but we, I mean, we never, every gig that we did, any money that we meant, we made, went to some local organisation, really, you know, rape crisis centre, or maybe some kid who wanted to make a fanzine, or some band needed a speaker, or the youth club needed a table, or a ping pong table, or something, but we never ever we took what we needed, which was enough to pay the petrol, have some food. We never stayed in hotels or anything like that. We just asked people where they got somewhere we could stay. Um, and we always used to come back devastatingly broke, although a lot of money had been made. Jimmy Percy from the from Sham Sixty Nine <clears throat> was working. Yeah, was working with um, Polydor, and it was a thing he was going to do called Percy's Package. So we had already decided, fuck you, we're doing all right on our own, yeah, crash records, we're doing fine things. Let's go and see what they've got to offer. So we go in and of course it's the, the guy shows us in his, and there's the guy behind his desk with a big bowl of flowers and all the drinks, da da da, I'm like, yeah, don't mind, and this drink arrives, and this guy, I'm like, woo. <laughs> and he goes, now, I, c I can market your revolution. I can get you into property. You'll have so much money, and I was like, Sounds fantastic. Nah, fuck it. <laughs> so, uh, what did you say to him? <clears throat> thanks, but no thanks. We were polite. So, yeah, just weren't interested. How could you do it? How, c how could we do it? It's, and to this day, do you know what I mean? I still can't do, uh, do, you know, do things where I feel like I might be not selling out, but where my conscience pricks me, and, and it's a pretty good thing to have because it means, well, I, hopefully I'll never sell out if, if that still is relevant. Yes, that's right, hard case, then it's just another tape, but I found a country to say, but I've got locked up plastic chases, your boss of this shit, but I'm a bit on the matters, three, four years, but I'm out of the clash, I'm a revolutionist, just some cash, I've become a fresh lock in, but used to be, I can't be a do it wrong.
Ignorant and G. Yeah. <laughs> God. <laughs> Romantic, even. Oh, the mask is still up. Mm. That's Joy. Ron. Ron. Me. Yeah, and Nima. It doesn't seem so long ago, but it's strange, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> doesn't it look like you're tall. It doesn't, does it? No, it's really weird. How did Crash end? Um, I think there was a schism developing. Uh, well, I don't think, I know there was. Um, I wrote a, we did a tour in 83, I think it was, and I wrote a article questioning the honesty of pacifism um, in the sense that it's very easy to preach it, but can you follow it through? But anyway, that was, you know, it was becoming obvious by then that, you know, there was a very distinct separation going on. Um, and it wasn't just sort of the pacifist activist thing, it was the security, not security thing, or the sort of spiritual materialist thing, all sorts of different things, you know, there were schisms appearing. And, and so that is that, I mean, that's a simple thing, but it's quite an important thing, because some of the people were obviously sort of, oh, well, they were sort of looking at it as a livelihood. Well, I don't get that, I don't understand livelihood. You know, I understand life, but I don't understand livelihood. You know, I think it's a sort of absurdity. We're not prostitutes. I'm not a prostitute. I was actually quite ill, physically ill. Um, I kind of wore myself out, because for me it was continual. You know, the band kind of rehearsed and did the gigs and, you know, I would be there doing the films you know, and operating a lot of the stuff. Doing the, but when I got back, I would have to start a new cover. So it was quite an intense kind of eight, nine years. You know, when we stopped, we knew we were going to stop then anyway. We'd always said 1984, so... When Andy left, I think 83 or beginning of 84, we knew that was a natural ending anyway, so there was no way we would replace him. He just wanted to get back to what he really wanted to do was painting and stuff. And, mm -hmm. and he, I think he was worn, I think everybody was worn out, quite honestly. <laughs> you know, and also, you know, the, the whole way we'd been put on a pedestal, you know, and uh, the way people were waiting for Christ to, what should we do next, you know, and that wasn't what we were there for, you know, it was to empower people, not to empower people to say, well, what do we do now? You know, where do we go next? You know, that wasn't our role. You know, we were just trying to share maybe an insight that we felt we had and experiences that we'd had. In the very beginning, 1984 was the, the cut-off time anyway. If we couldn't say what we wanted to say in that time, then there was no point in going on. So. Then it would be an institution. Yeah, exactly, and that's what it was becoming and we weren't interested in it. You know, seven years away from your own being is a long time. Um, and we all is were. That, is that what, if, what it felt like? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we were living other, you know, we were living a piece of, we were living a theatre, you know, for about day and night. You know, I remember once making love with Eve and thinking, oh, I'm making love to Eve Libertine. I'm not making love to Bron Jones, who's my girlfriend. You know, I'm making, you know, I'm making love to a sort of idea. Um, you know, that sort of thing, and, and, and you sort of realise that actually, you be, in seven years you can become quite an idea of yourself, and not yourself, because you've forgotten who yourself was, because all, every day, every fucking moment, you're, you know, it's either in the studio, writing a song, doing an interview, being this, being that, you know, you didn't have time to be 
to know who you were. And that's why it was so painful for us when the band stopped, because suddenly, you know, you'd be sitting at breakfast and there'd be someone sitting the other, and you'd think, well, who the fuck are you? Um, because we hadn't got the common connection anymore. I am alone. I don't know about you. And I am the moment. And I am the grace. And this is my time. And this is my place. I won't accept no sorry apology. No pale reflection of possibility. There is no force but my own. In a way, we'd, when we were writing stuff, or when I was writing stuff for Christ, you know, I was defining you know, um, a way of living, you know, especially there is no authority but yourself. You know, which basically, be, I suppose because G and myself have stayed here, we've had to try and live up to that. Um, you know, all the time we're being, you know, like you've come there here because of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, basically to see if we were doing it. Um, you know, well that's true, isn't it, in a way, you know, to what extent did that dream work? Um, and I mean, that's a question we we both ask ourselves all the time. You know, to what extent does the dream work? You know, how can we how how could we make it work better? Commodity culture is it, it, you know has got such a stranglehold, you know, and seems to be an increasing stranglehold. That, um, you know, the pockets of resistance. Um, you know, might be becoming very isolated. Where are the where are the angry young men and women of today that that uh, that are actually saying, apart from little band, you might see a punk rock band in a pub somewhere, um, but but where are these people in the establishment uh, or in the established you know pop world or the music industry who are saying this is fucking wrong? Fuck you, stand up and you know what happened to that voice? It's all sort of gone. but yourself.